Well, next on the show, health care announcements, new ICU beds at the Grace, changes to monitoring high-risk offenders, and MLAs being admonished by the Speaker. All topics of discussion for Premier Heather Stephenson, who is in studio for our regular monthly interview. Good morning to you. Good morning, Marcy. So let's start with uh, your, your announcement. Uh, the uh, ICU beds, uh, $30 million you announced this week, uh, expanding at the Grace Hospital from 10 to 30 beds. Um, obviously, we spoke during the height of COVID. Uh, you, you were asked about reopening ICU beds at that time that had been previously cut by the government. Um, why now uh, for the timing of this now? So certainly this is something that the Grace Hospital has been asking for. And I was at the foundation dinner last fall and made this commitment then. And so we're just following through on that commitment. It's definitely needed in the community. And so um, we think that this is a, a positive step forward for the Grace Hospital. Um, staffing, and I know you've addressed this a little bit, but staffing ER especially takes time takes training. Uh, You have a plan to add 2,000 healthcare professionals to the system. I know right now they're retaining um, what we have is, is, you know, of paramount paramount importance. Uh, Where are the workers specifically to staff these beds? What's what's the plan for that? Yeah, so this will, um, this is uh, 30 million towards the construction of the ICU unit. And um, so this is more on the capital side, but obviously um, they will come up with what is needed on the health human resources side. We've already announced are $200 million uh, dollars towards 2,000 more healthcare professionals, which we've all also like um, already recruited almost 800 healthcare professionals uh, to date just in the last five months. So we're well on our way there. Um, and uh, and obviously, those resources will come out of this and in, in, our, in our recruitment, uh, retention and training efforts. Um, any concern that sort of the, uh, while well, the capital investment is, uh, is, a, is a step forward, obviously, any beds is going to be welcome. The, the nightmare is that they're going to sit idle because you can't the staffing won't catch up because we're in such a shortage well again it's going to take time to build these um, these suites so between now I don't believe the construction is starting until uh, next summer and so there is time again for that recruitment training um, and I know the WRHA did address that issue at the uh, news conference that day um, I want to uh, talk about uh, what was uh, announced yesterday by uh, by the opposition um, the the NDP yesterday came out uh, talking about something that uh, will relate back to your government here. So they outlined uh, rural health care yesterday. Uh, one of their promises was to reinstate a program where medical students would get cash in exchange for practicing in rural communities upon graduation. Um, I know that you ended that program in 2017. Um, why did you come to a different conclusion about what might be the right way forward for rural health care? Yeah, we know that, that health human resources is a significant challenge, not just here in Manitoba, but across the country. That's why we announced our $200 million dollars towards 2,000 more healthcare professionals. Uh, just the other day, there was an RFP out um, by Shared Health uh, to recruit 150 um, healthcare professionals to rural communities and northern communities as well. So we're already working towards that. Uh, so much of what the NDP announced is already in, in progress. And uh, so I, I think it's important to know that in southwestern Manitoba, we have, you know, Brandon, which is going to become a healthcare hub. We were out making announcements on further, on more, you know, cancer cancer care um, out in that community in, in more um, health care closer to home in, in those communities. So much of what uh, they announced we're already doing, and, and we know in the past they closed almost 20 rural ERs in the past and uh, when they were in government before, and so we can expect more of, of that uh, if they get into power again. Um, the, the program you ended, though, I'm just curious around the thinking around what will work, because both of you are going to come up with different solutions for what will work in rural Manitoba. So the, the, uh, the incentives for the students... Um, to, to stay in practice. Is that still something you feel is uh, is is not the right way to go to retain workers in those rural areas? You well, talked I, about some of your other directions. Yeah, we, we have an RFP out, uh, Shared Health does uh, right now, to recruit 150 healthcare professionals to rural and northern communities. So those will have, you know, various incentives for, you know, on the recruitment side. And uh, so we'll, we'll see, you know, what that looks like uh, moving forward. But I think we're already moving in that direction to ensure that we have those healthcare professionals working out in, in rural and northern communities. Uh, what else is uh, is key to your uh, to 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 your plans to improve uh, access to healthcare in rural Manitoba? 
So obviously, I mean, again, we're looking at uh, capital infrastructure, $1.2 billion towards a new hospital in Nipua in uh, Portage La Prairie, um, making Brandon uh, a hub for uh, southwestern Manitoba to ensure that um, people have access closer to home so that they're not having to come into Winnipeg all the time. And so we're already putting those mechanisms in place. Health, human resources, big part of that, which we've just talked about. Um, so we have uh, a very definitive plan to ensure that those those healthcare resources are there in, in rural and northern communities where they're needed. Um, should smaller, um, people might hear the Brandon Healthcare Cub, uh, Hub in two ways. On one hand, and as you said, it could be seen as a positive thing not having to come to Winnipeg. Mm -hmm. But there could be smaller people living in small towns all around thinking, does that mean I'm going to be losing what access I have? Because we have been doing stories about already ERs and access being lost in those, you know, individual smaller centres. Will people expect more losses to their immediate communities and, and having to be prepared more to travel? No, I, I think, you know, what it is is rather than having to come in for various diagnostic procedures into Winnipeg, that they'll be able, be able to have that health care access closer to home. You can't have all things in all communities, but but our whole thing is about keeping people closer to home. Your government yesterday said it would bolster supervision of offenders who were out on bail or probation. How do you hope that will improve uh, public safety? Well, first of all, we need to ensure that there's bail reform with the federal government, and so we're still calling on that. Um, I did, as my in my role as uh, the chair of the Council of Federation, all the premiers across the country, uh, working with the Canadian Association of Chiefs of Police as well. Danny Smythe is the chair of that. Uh, we've been working towards that bail reform, but until that happens, right now we want to ensure that if people People are out on bail that we're putting various enhancements in place to ensure that um, that our communities are safer. There's some concern uh, that, that people who are lower risk could be swept up in the changes that you know they, they could spend time in remand when they actually could be safely in community. Can you share more about how the specifics of the assessment process will work? So I don't know all the the details of this and how this will unfold and I know the, the minister will be able to get into more of the details around that but I think the important thing here is that we recognize their there's, there's a gap, and we want to fill that gap uh, where needed and uh, obviously focus on those who um, are, uh, you know, violent offenders uh, in, in all of this as well and really focus on those. Um, so how important is it to you then that that assessment is really clearly laid out so people aren't swept up? That, that I, I think it is very important, obviously, in, in all of this process. Um, our focus is on the repeat violent offenders, and those are who we want to ensure uh, remain behind bars. I want to ask you about decorum at the ledge. Mm. Uh, in the past few weeks, the speakers had to weigh in on two separate occasions. Uh, Minister Abi Khan, NDP leader Wab Canoe's tense exchange, she said she did not have jurisdiction to weigh in. It didn't happen inside the ledge. But I want to quote what Myrna Dreger said. She said, quote, I'm troubled that either version of the incident could have occurred at all. I wish you could all treat each other respectfully and honorably, end quote. She also weighed in on the previous exchange uh, between the health minister and a critic, uh, to which she said, quote, I'm challenging all of us to do better when it comes to respectfully disagreeing. And that would include being careful about making allegations and attributing motives when heckling, end quote. How do you feel at the ledge? I mean, in terms of I guess, how should Manitobans feel? Is there a deterioration in the environment? How concerning is this to you as, as Premier? Heckling's been around for as long as I've been there and, and, and predates me for 22 years. I've seen it uh, way more heated than it has been in the past. Um, but I, I don't like it at all, frankly, Marcy. Uh, I, I'm not a combative person. I don't like, you know, that kind of, of behavior in general. Um, but I will say that, um, you know, it's it's uh, their side of the house is as much as it is ours. And, and I think, you know, the important thing here is that, um, you know, we do have children visiting in the galleries, uh, in the gallery, sometimes during question period. We need to maintain that decorum. And uh, I know at times it gets it gets heated and people may say things that that, uh, you know, they regret saying. But um, I think and I've seen that over, you know, the de two decades that I've been there. Uh, but, you know, I would prefer that um, there's better decorum. What would you say about the importance of resetting the tone, given that a lot of Manitobans might be 
really turned off by all of it. I mean, we're in a day and age where there's so much polarization. We have such serious issues going on in this province. What would you say about the real need to do that, especially as we're heading into an election? Well, again, Marcy, I like to focus on the issues and uh, that we uh, debate and have a healthy debate on the floor of, uh, of the chamber. I think that's what Manitobans expect us to have, and uh, that's, what I would, that's what I would like to see. Uh, election. Will you rule out an early election call? <laughs> the election will be on October 3rd. <laughs> that sounds like you've ruled out an early election call for us this morning. Thank you for watching the CBC Manitoba YouTube channel. Don't forget to like and subscribe. For the latest breaking news and top stories, download the CBC News app.